Morning, church. If you're visiting and don't know me, my name is Pastor Aaron, and it's a privilege to uh, invite you and, and uh, to be a part of this service and, and to recognize your presence here, and I thank you very much for that. You know, I've, I've um, some of you know who know me know that I grew up in a preacher's home. So for 65 years, basically, I've been in the church. And there was a period of time, truthfully, mm, you know, a period of maybe five, six years, roughly, that I probably wasn't as involved in the church, seeking the church, working through the church that, that uh, was the rest of my time. And, and those years would have been the young adult years, the college age and beyond years of my life. And so I am just thrilled and delighted to, to be here and to, to be a part of this where these young adults would be leading us with their faith in this worship service. So thank you for that. We are in a church-wide study right now using the book, I Will. Uh, this is week four. And so the, the rest of the service, the sermon, is uh, related to that. Let's, let's join together in our traditional prayer. Heavenly Father, as we come to this moment now in our worship experience today, I ask that either through me or in spite of me, you would speak to us and our lives would be changed. In Christ's name I pray. Amen. So this last week was Grandma and Granddad week with the grandchildren. Um, kept the kids for several days. Mom and Dad you know, had an issue that they needed to take care of, and so we, we got to be grandparents. And every grandparent in here knows that we had a, a wonderful time for those days, and we gladly took them back to Mom and Dad. I am not sure about the validity of this statement that's, that's up here, but I just thought it was kind of interesting. I, I don't know how that fits in. But you know, this week as, as I was preparing for the sermon and, and we had the kids, I was struck at the language that I was continually listening to from these young children. I mean, it was incredible. It's all about what they want. Can I have this? Give me that. I want to do that. It's my turn. That's not yours. Will you buy me this? Can we do it some more? Can we stay here longer? Give me some more of that. That's mine. I don't want to. Do it again. I mean, on and on and on, endlessly it went. Being served. I mean, that's where our human nature is. That's where we want to be. The world says that's the golden spot to be in, being served. And it starts young, this self-serving demanding. I mean, jeez. Our life, Peggy and my life, pretty much revolved around our grandkids this last week. They lacked nothing, starting with attention from us. And yet, they never stopped wanting from us. It occurs to me what's particularly sad is when we actually meet older people who have never grown out of that. I know quite a few of them. And you know what else? It seems to me an unfortunate reality that even we as Christians have a tendency to treat God that very way. I mean, we're always asking God for something, it seems, aren't we? I mean, how do you pray most of the time? Talking to God, you know, please fix this, change that, heal her, rescue him, give me peace, take this away, help them see, give me strength turn him around. I mean, on and on and on we go, right? Be honest, right? You know, at one point, 
with the grandkids this last week. Granddad just put his foot down and he said, all right, that's it. You are not allowed to ask for one more thing. Don't you ask us for one more thing until I tell you otherwise. Got it? And you know, when I did that, I meant it. But do you know what came down on me at that point? I wonder if that's exactly what God feels like saying to us sometimes. Hmm? You know, our human nature wants it all. But God tells us that's not what life is all about. We can't have it all. We, we can't have it both ways. We can't have our cake and eat it too. We can't do whatever we want to do Monday through Saturday and then come worship God on Sunday and it's okay. It's not okay. We can't cheat and lie to others and then sing praises to God. That's not okay. We can't serve our own interests and serve our neighbors as well. No, that doesn't work. We can't read the Bible and then refuse to follow it in decision-making just to avoid any strife that might come from the world. No! It doesn't work that way. Why not? I mean, why can't we do those things? Why doesn't it work that way? It's because God won't stand for it. He says we must willfully choose who we will serve. I will. Remember we talked about how that that involves choosing. I get to choose. I freely choose. That's the focus of this book that we're studying. That we would choose to be outwardly focused. And one of the basic truths that we teach our children up here is, I must make the wise choice. This week, what are we choosing to do? I will serve. Those salty servant tabs that we talk about all the time, those orange tabs in the back of these chairs, that's what this service is about this week. That's what this sermon is about today. That's what this chapter is about that we're studying. Dr. Martin Luther King Jr. said, anyone can be great because anyone can serve. That's a powerful statement. Those words might remind us of the words of Jesus. Remember that he declared, I did not come to be served, but I came to serve and to give my life as a ransom for many. I mean, and think how that worked out in his life. On the night before he was crucified, when he knew he was going to the cross, to pay for the sins of the whole world. When the weight of the whole world was on his shoulders, what did he do? He took a towel and a basin of water and he washed the dirty feet of every one of the disciples. By that one simple gesture, he showed forever what sort of a man he was and what sort of people we are supposed to be. He came to serve. And in his death on the cross, he did serve all humankind. Dr. King is right. Greatness is open to everyone Because anyone can and should choose to serve. Most of the time, you know, we're just kind of rocking along, contented, knowing that, well, someone else, someone else is serving, so that's okay. I mean, after all, that's why we elect leaders. That's why we acquire pastors and hire staff. I mean, serving, that's fine. As long as, as long as we know they're doing that. As long as they accomplish that. And that works until there's a crisis. But when a crisis comes, you see, then we have to see things, we look at things, we're forced to see things differently. 
The Chinese word for crisis is actually made up of two symbols, one meaning danger and the other meaning opportunity. Wow. Wow. So a crisis is both a danger and an opportunity wrapped up into one. In the book of Acts, chapter 6, if you have your Bibles, I invite you to just go ahead and turn it to there. Acts, chapter 6, the first seven verses tells us a story in the early church about a sudden and unexpected controversy that arose in the church and threatened the unity of that church. In just seven brief verses, Luke describes the problem and the solution and the result of this controversy, this turmoil. And when we get to the end of the story, the good news is we we learn that more people are serving the Lord, more people are being one to Christ, and the unity of the church is restored. That's good news. So let's look at this. The problem. What is the problem? Well, the problem is that the Greek Jews are complaining against the Hebrew Jews because their widows are being overlooked in the daily distribution of the food. See that in verse 1. This is the first case of racial prejudice in the Christian church. The Hebrew Jewish Christian converts spoke Hebrew. Actually, they probably spoke Aramaic, which is a dialect of Hebrew. And in contrast, the Greek Jewish Christian converts spoke Greek. So there are two groups. They looked differently, they acted differently, they talked differently, but they're both in the church together. The Hebrew-speaking Jewish Christian widows, that's a mouthful, isn't it? We're being favored over the Greek-speaking Jewish Christian widows for the daily distribution of the food. Perhaps it wasn't being done intentionally. Nevertheless, it was being done. One group was being favored over another group. A problem. Now listen, it's wishful thinking to encounter a minor problem in the church. That never happened. There is no minor problem in the church, ever. Everything in the church that happens, happens to personal friends. And that makes everything a serious problem, and it demands serious attention. Churches have split over way less than what we're reading about in this passage from Acts. So how would the modern church, you know, you stop to think, what would the modern church do to solve this problem? We had this issue, this controversy. It's very likely that the church might just start a whole new church. You know, the first united Jewish, Christian, Greek-speaking church of Jerusalem. Or maybe they would agree to have two separate lunch programs. You know, the traditional Hebrew-speaking lunch at 9 o'clock and then the contemporary Greek-speaking lunch at 10.30. And if you put the matter in those terms, it doesn't seem so far-fetched to us anymore, does it? We all understand that. So the solution, the solution comes in verses 2 through 6. Verses 2 through 6 tell us how they confronted this problem and set about a four-step process to overcome it. First, there was this immediate response. The 12 apostles called the group together. You can see that right there in verse 2. And when they called everyone together, they said, look, it wouldn't be right for us 12 to neglect the ministry of the Word of God in, 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 in prayer in order to wait on the tables. And you know, and whenever I read that, that's that always just kind of takes me back, makes me, makes me stop for a second, because, you know, at, at first glance, that seems kind of harsh. That, that even seems re- almost judgmental. I mean, after 30 years being in the ministry, I can easily imagine 
people in the church saying something like this. Wouldn't it be great if the apostles got together and took over the feeding of the Greek-speaking widows? That would send a really powerful message to the whole congregation, and it would bring healing to the two groups. I mean, after all, the apostles are Hebrew-speaking Jews, and this would prove that they really are concerned about the Greek-speaking widows. I'm, I'm almost positive. At least someone in that church thought that, even if they didn't actually say that or propose that out loud. I mean, what could be better than for the leaders to set the pace personally in solving this problem? That's an easy, tempting solution to look at. And yet that's not what happened in this story. That touchy-feely idea would actually have caused the apostles to disobey God's will in their lives. They understood that God had called them to the ministry of word and prayer. Anything that moved them away from that priority, no matter how good or noble, maybe even necessary that thing might be, it actually would become a diversion from their true calling of what God wanted them to do. And that is a huge message, church. Because the bottom line of that message indicates that absolutely every person in the church is essential. It may seem hard-hearted at first on the part of these 12, but really what it boils down to is achieving a biblical focus in the fellowship of the people. We must not let the good crowd out the best or allow the urgent to push what is important off the agenda of people who have already entered into established ministries. Since no one can do everything, spiritual leaders must commit themselves to what they have primarily been called to do, and then others also come and commit to doing what they can do in the process for the body. So they need to make a plan. I mean, we have these widows who are going hungry. What are we going to do? How are we going to fix this? How are we going to handle this problem? How many of you remember years ago hearing this little jingle. There was an important job to be done. Everybody was asked to do it, and everybody was sure that somebody would do it. Anybody could have done it, but nobody did it. Somebody got angry about that because it was everybody's job, but everybody thought anybody could do it, but nobody realized that everybody wouldn't do it. And it ended up that everybody blamed somebody when actually nobody asked anybody. What the church in Acts realized was that the entire congregation needed to be involved. And so they chose seven members from among them. And they did that with qualifications. Those seven members had to be full of the Spirit and wisdom. And then they committed a delegation. They delegated a commitment of of delegation of responsibility to this. And when we choose these people, we will turn this responsibility over to them. That's an incredible model and a wise approach for how the church can deal with its problems. Rather than issuing an edict from on high, they asked the congregation from within them to choose seven members who can then turn their attention to serving the widows. And they chose seven spiritually mature people who would immediately have the respect of the rest of the church. 
Luke says this, this proposal, this idea, pleased everyone. And so the chosen list of people was unique in that every one of those seven people had Greek names, meaning that the congregation had chosen Greek-speaking servants to solve this problem. These seven people no doubt already knew many of the widows personally, and the Greek-speaking people would have trusted these seven in how they handled this problem. There's an excellent way to go about dealing with this problem. So, then they brought these seven people in front of the whole congregation and the twelve, and they laid their hands on them, and they blessed them and prayed for them, and set them about the service. That final step is really important, because what that establishes is that the full weight of the church is behind this ministry and the solution. And what was the result of this? Well, verse 7. It's pretty significant results. It says, first, there was a whole new receptivity to the message. The word of God spread because of this. Secondly, there were many new converts. The number of disciples in Jerusalem increased rapidly. And then there were conversions of people who were even in leadership places. It says, large number of priests became obedient to the faith. You see, the witness in the way the church dealt with this problem was so powerful that the gospel exploded out into the community. By God's grace, people were added to the kingdom and the threat to the church dissolved. Wow. So what do we learn from this? What do we take from this in our lives? Well, first of all, we can learn the importance of proper priorities in the work of the Lord. Everyone needs to do what they have been asked to do or gifted to do or had put on their hearts to do by God and the Holy Spirit. Everyone is needed to do that. Proper priorities. This is my place. I need to do this. Second thing, the impossibility of just a few people doing all the work in any church. It's impossible for that to happen. I mean, that's logical. The apostles said very clearly, we cannot do our work and feed the widows. That's the same in any church you want to look at. Any church fellowship has the same issue. Someone cannot preach and take care of the nursery at the same time. No church staff can do all that needs to be done in a church. It's impossible for just a few to do all the work of the church. 1 Corinthians chapter 12 is a chapter that talks about the variety of gifts. It talks about us being members of the body, and each member has its own role and gift. That's because God never intended that one person or even one group of people would do all that needs to be done in the local church. Every member is needed. Lesson number three, the blessing that occurs when many people are using their gifts in many ways. You know, in the beginning, the widows were going hungry and their friends were upset. And so from that came some anger and some bitterness, which threatened the unity and the well-being of the whole body, the church. And by the end of the solution, the anger and the bitterness is gone. The widows are being fed because a group of servers had been called and they now are faithfully doing what God wants them to do and the church is benefiting from that. That's precisely how the body of Christ is supposed to function in every congregation. So, 
I want you to repeat this sentence after I give it to you, because it's probably one of the one of the takeaways, in my opinion, one of the takeaways from this sermon. No one does everything, but everyone does something. Say that with me. No one does everything, but everyone does something. You know what? That is God's plan for the local church. No one does everything, but everyone does something. Some do more. Yes, that's true. Some do less. Yes. But everyone does something. There are lots of inspirations that I have had over the years, and one of the latest ones is is from our dear sister Irene Francis sitting back here. She says it very well. She says, given my age and my circumstances now, I, I really can't be as active as I used to be. But I can still write notes and I can still pray. Yes. Yes. That is the New Testament spirit of serving. And I am not just trying to single her out because I'm well aware and we are blessed that there are many people in this church just like her with that attitude. Thank God for that. Then the last thing we can learn from this, number four, the value of serving others through practical deeds of kindness. You know, most Bible commentators say that this is exactly the story, this is the place where the concept of deacons in the church come from. These seven people were deacons. That's literally the word that is used. The word means to serve. The verb literally means to wait on tables. Deacons, they're serves. Deacons are deaconesses. They're servants. That's That's where this comes from right here. Ministering to others through the practical deeds of kindness. They roll up their sleeves. Deacons, they see something that he's done. They roll up their sleeves and they get busy serving where service is needed. These deacons obeyed God's will by serving the widows just as much as the apostles obeyed God's will by proclaiming the word and being in prayer. You see, it's not an either-or situation. Some people need to devote themselves to the word and to prayer, and other people need to be able to roll up their sleeves and get involved in service. And don't begin thinking that it just has to happen inside the church. No, it's not just about being inside the church. Anyone can be great Because anyone can serve. Serving is others is when we are able to reach out and anyone who hears these words is able to become great by reaching out in service. Here are the words I want you to listen to. Excerpt it. From Paul's letter to the Colossians in the third chapter. Because that chapter is all about how we live our Christian lives. He starts off by saying, If then you have been raised with Christ, seek the things that are above where Christ is. Set your minds on things that are above and not things that are on earth. For you have died, and your life is hidden with Christ in God. In other words, that physical life that you are looking at here, it's, it's, there's nothing to that. You know, what you're looking toward is the spiritual life that lasts forever with Christ. That's an incredible identity statement. So let's personalize it. You have died and your life is hidden in Christ. So to personalize that, we would say, I have died and my life is hidden in Christ. Repeat that with me. I have died, and my life is hidden in Christ. 
Now, I want you to see how practical this becomes because he begins laying out very, very practical ways in which we flesh that out in our lives. Whatever you do, verse 17, whatever you do, word or deed, do it in the name of the Lord Jesus. Wives, submit yourselves to your husbands. There's a category of people. And incidentally, as he writes this, it's pretty much assumed that virtually everybody, male and female, are going to end up being married. So he's really talking to females here. Wives, submit yourselves to your husbands as is fitting to the Lord. Husbands, love your wives and do not be harsh with them. He's talking about service. He's talking about how we serve one another. Not just in the church, but in our everyday lives. Children, he says, obey your parents. See how he's becoming inclusive here. For this pleases the Lord. Parents, don't provoke your children, lest they become discouraged with you. Slaves, today we would say employees. Obey in everything those who are over you. And whatever you do, work heartily as for the Lord and not for other people, knowing that from the Lord you will receive an inheritance as your reward. You are serving the Lord in your daily life. See, we all are in situations of service. Everyone can be great because everyone can serve. Everyone leads someone. You can't lead someone without serving them. That's impossible to do that. And here's the bottom line for us. We will never be more like Jesus than when we are serving others. That's the epitome of becoming like Christ. God is looking for sons and daughters who will become salty servants. Who's going to join up? Will you join up? Yes, I will. Heavenly Father, what an awesome morning this has been. Thank you so much for these young people and the faith that you have um, opened up into their lives and the way they've responded and, and how they've shared that with us today and the energy that they have brought to us and, and, the, and the excitement and the hope that we have, the hope that we see from that. Lord, it's just just a thrill to be a part of that today. We thank you so much. And then, Lord, we also are mindful of how you, you call us to serve. Each one of us, every one of us, a place of service in your church and in the world serving those who you put in front of us. Each person you put in front of us. So Father, we, we hear that today. And we commit, we dedicate to being your servants today. And Father, as we walk out of this building and we come face to face this week, Give us the heart to serve every face in front of us. So that we might be you to them. In Christ's name we pray. Amen.